1 through 14 this morning. Let's read it, and then we'll come back and expound upon it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Now remember, saints is another word for believers. It's not that little statue that we used to put on the dashboard of our station wagons or our parents did. He's speaking here of believers, of saints. He says, Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Father, thank you, God. I thank you for those of us who have allowed your light to come into our life, to expose who we were, and to break us, Lord God, to our knees in receiving you as Savior and Lord. Thank you so much, Father, for sending your only begotten Son. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for us. And now, as we expound upon these, God, go beyond my notes. Lord, speak to us individually and congregationally. And if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, or maybe they're backslidden, maybe they've, uh, they've drifted, I pray that today that will change, that they would come to know you as Savior, that they would come back to a Father who loves them. They would come back to one who died for them. Teach us, God. Empower us and encourage us for we live in this dark world, Lord. And even those of us who are saved trip up and trip over some of these things. But thank you by your precious Holy Spirit that we can get back up and get back on the path of righteousness. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Everybody said amen. So guys, so far we have seen in the movement through this book as we started it over in chapter 1, verse 1, that the first three chapters, Paul had us to really sit, right? Sit and come to understand who we are in Christ. He's had us to sit and understand what we believe and why we believe as Christians. I called this, remember, the lecture portion. Chapters 1 through 3, you're sitting you're receiving. It's the lecture. In chapters 4 and 5 that we're in now, well, Paul has us to live what we now know, live it out. And as we live it out, this, he says, that is the lab portion. We've had the the lecture. Now it's the lab. Uh, Putting to practice what we have learned. And then in chapter 6, Paul would have us to stand, and we'll get there in a couple years. Just kidding. He'd have us to stand, to take a stand in what we believe, in who we are, and how we walk in and for the Lord, the full armor of God. Amen? 
Last Sunday, we were exhorted to put away that which is unbecoming of a Christian, unbecoming of a saint, of a child of God. Put those things away to take off and to put on, remember? And that is the new creature in Christ. To put away habits and practices and behaviors and attitudes we once displayed or lived by. And as I continue to remind you, we can do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 5 now, Paul is, again, he's encouraging us in our, in our Christian walk. It's, it's the lab. It's still the lab. It's still going out and practicing what we now have been taught. He gives to us insights to help us focus on the, the one whom we are to be like, the one in whom we are to emulate. And, of course, that is our Savior, Jesus. And we can imitate him by applying his unconditional love as he, has, as he will show us to others. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 10, 12, that love covers all sins. Peter would, would re- reference it saying that love covers a multitude of sins. And for that, we're so blessed. And yet with that, we are to practice as well. It was through the love of Christ that covered our sins and atoned forever. And as we had left off in chapter 4, as Paul so so wrote that we are to do this as God in Christ has forgiven us. He also will speak of walking in the light being exposed daily to his light, living in his light, being children of light. And, and that is accepting the conviction that that light brings into our heart as we pray and read in his word and then being that light in his dark world, in this dark world, being that difference to others. So let's get into it. The first portion, verses 1 through 7 Paul would have us to walk in love. Therefore, he says, therefore, from what we have read already, not only in what we've seen last week, but everything in chapter 4, he says, as you're putting these things away, as you're walking as this new person, this new man and new woman in Christ, he says, be imitators of God as their children. The word for imitator is an interesting word in the Greek is mimetes. And we get our English word mimic from. It really means a follower. It means someone who copies after another. Now those of you who have or had small children, three, four, five years old, you remember doing the painting in that one room or working on the car or hanging up some drapery or doing something around the house and your, your kids wanted to help. And you let them help, knowing that as soon as they get bored, you're going to have to go back and fix what they, what they messed up with. But, it's, but they're watching us. They're, they're, man, they're watching us and start to mimic us at one years old. I mean, and, and that's kind of humbling, isn't it? Because sometimes it's good what they're mimicking, and other times it's not. I remember a couple that came here, and God bless them, they both got saved, and as we said, they're, they're on that journey of, uh, 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 you know, just learning about Christ. And we'd be at potlucks, and they'd had some kids, and, and all of a sudden, these French words would come out of their kid's mouth, and, and you see the parents turning red, and no condemnation. You know, they're just learning life, but it really told on how, how they mimic us. Uh, it's, just, uh, it's just kind of funny. It's not funny, but you know what I mean. But kids will. They'll, they'll tell on us, won't they? You should hear what they say in Sunday school, by the way. But anyway, forget about it. Your your teachers, your your helpers, they understand. You know, there's there's no there's no condemnation. But they want to mimic us, and 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 we should want to mimic our heavenly Father. We should want to mimic our Savior. We we, we should want to, as Paul says, be imitators of God. First uh, Corinthians eleven one. Paul even went to the point where he said, "Imitate me." Just as I, so I also imitate Christ. Now, can we say that? Uh, can, can that be typed out, printed out, put up in our house or on our desk? Uh, 
imitate me just as I imitate Christ. And we all know that Paul wasn't perfect. But Paul's bullseye, his goal, was always to be an imitator of God, to be an imitator of Christ. He had men around him. He had fellowship. He had those he was accountable to. Those within his team, although he was the apostle, the lead, he was the the senior pastor, we could say. He had a group of men around him that would keep him accountable. And he had men who helped him in his ministry. And men who also wanted to also walk after God and imitate him. Christ is our hero of whom we should want to emulate. And as corny as this sounds, you remember this old saying, what would Jesus do? Unfortunately, it's corny today, but really, that's truth. What would Jesus do? It's one thing to have the bracelet. It's quite another to live by it. Many of us, we start to take the bracelet off. Now put it back on. Some of you on the 95 go 95. And yet I see your stickers. Oh, Jesus loves me and, and, you know, and all these sweet stickers. No condemnation. It just cracks me up. That's why Calvary Chapel Ferguson doesn't have a sticker yet. Oh, they go to Calvary. Some say, I, I see it in California. Follow me to Calvary. How can I follow you? But uh, go, take them off if you're not going to obey the laws. But anyway... But to imitate him, we should. And that to the best of our ability, friends. And that by the power of the Holy Spirit. What does this mim- mimicking look like? Well, he, first of all, it's we are to walk in love. We are to walk in love. A life based upon love. And that word, you know, it's agape, right? It's that wonderful word that really... Scholars have a hard time defining other than it's just an unconditional love. It's a, it's a love that doesn't seek a reciprocal reaction. And when it does give it, when you do receive a reciprocal, it's a blessing, isn't it? As you're giving, just, 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 just want to love people, just want to care for people. You're not looking for a, for a pat on the back. You're not looking. But when it is given, it's a blessing. But, but you go forward in that and walking in that kind of love. Um, But I'll tell you what, that kind of love, when you walk that love, it will mark people. It will. It will mark on those who are the recipients of this type of love. They won't know how to handle it. They won't know how to respond to it because... The world is called to it. But we are called to it to walk in this unconditional love for others. But it does make, if you're doing it at work and you're helping somebody with a project or you're going mowing that neighbor's lawn or bringing cookies to the neighbor because you found out perhaps the husband was in the hospital or whatever the case may be, however you show it, it'll mark them. And it may, even, it may even bring up a conversation of why are you so loving? You, you really don't know. Why did you do this? You, and then you can say, I do it for my Lord. I, I do it for my Lord. The motivation is as Christ. Notice that, underline that, and walk in love as Christ, as Christ also has loved us. Romans 5, 5 tells us the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The love of God. God puts his love in our heart. And this means I can then love as Christ has also loved us. Because there are people, and we've probably said it ourselves. Let's don't raise your hand. I'm not Jesus. I'm not Christ. Ah, but Paul says that the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. And when something is poured out, poured in, it's prepared to be poured out. When something is poured in, it is prepared to be poured out. The Holy Spirit fills us, doesn't he, with with himself. The Holy Spirit empowers us. He fills us in order for us to 
pour out. And that's we pour it out in love and gifts. We pour in power. Hey, so how has Jesus loved us? And I want you to see three words. By giving himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for sweet aroma. So underline that. Giving, offering, and sacrifice. You can write in your Bibles, all right? Don't write in our Bible. We lend you one. I'm just kidding. It's okay to write in your Bible, man. Underline it, highlight it. That's what this kind of love looks like. That's how Jesus loved us. And friends, that's how he expects us to, be, to love others. Paul takes us to the altar, though. Notice, he's given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So he's given these Gentiles, for the most part, this church, a word picture of what goes on in the temple at Jerusalem. Many of them probably knew it. Even the heathen had their own altars. The heathen had their own offerings. But here he's specifically looking to the altar of sacrifice. There were bulls and lambs were offered to God. There where a man would take either for himself or his family at differing times and different festivals and requirements by the law would bring these animals to the priest. And it would be there where the priest would put his hand on the man and then on the animal. And it would be there where, in a sense, the transfer of his sin would go upon the animal. And then the animal would be killed, the blood would be spilt, and the carcass uh, would be given to the fire. And Paul says, in that whole transition, you see, the, the sacrifice, there is a, a sweet aroma You know it. It's barbecue, man. We kind of hit you guys at the second service during our potlucks, and we leave the door open a little bit so you'll hang out and have some of that barbecue. This is what Paul is saying. But to God, it's a sweet smell and aroma unto his nostrils, you see. Just imagine that barbecue smell. Just imagine there that sweet smell and aroma. But it is in that word picture that love is defined for us through Christ. Love is given. Love is an offering. And love is a sacrifice. Love is given? Yeah, it's selfless. Jesus displayed this definition of love for us. That while we were yet sinners, he gave his life for us. And that on the altar, but the altar of the cross. You see, as I explained, when the man came and the priest would lay hands on both the man and the animal, that was only temporary. It was called the kofar, the covering. What Christ did on the cross, amen, was forever. No more sacrifices. No more bringing a lamb or a bull. If you blew it, you bring a bull. Everybody knew it. Hey, there's Ramirez with a bull. Boy, he really blew it this week. Ah. It's about Jesus. He was the sacrifice, the body required by God. The sacrifice. And it is here that Paul is bringing this to light. That's love given. Selfless love. And then love is an offering. It's not a duty. It's an offering. It's not an obligation. But it's an act from one's own heart from one's own heart for others. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Jesus laid his life down. Jesus displayed this offering. He was the offering, as I said, that God required. Everything else before Christ, before the cross, before Calvary, Golgotha, before being sent outside of the city, to that hill, to die. Everything before that was just temporary. It was the Old Testament saint doing his duty, his obligation. But this, what Christ did, was not a duty, was not an obligation. It was for love and obedience to his Father for our souls so we wouldn't be lost. So why wouldn't you give your life to Christ? What part of that love don't you want in your life? He paid for our sins. You could leave here different. 
if that's what you want. And then, love is a sacrifice. It's a cost. It cost his life. It pleased his father to give his son as the ultimate sacrifice for saving man. But let's put it now in more applicable terms. Those are holy terms. That's what love looks like. That's what as Christ love looked like. But as Christ love also can enter into our personal relationships with one another, can enter into our marriages, that we are to love, to give selflessly, to offer, to, to offer ourselves. And yes, it is a sacrifice. It is a cost, but it's a wonderful cost. It's not a cost that will bankrupt you. It's not a cost will leave you empty, but it is, it is a cost. Hence, given, offering, sacrifice, this is the way God loved us. This is the way God wants us to walk in his love. So as we die daily to self, the scriptures tell us to pick up our cross, the cross again. What does that represent? It represents death to self, right? It represents salvation. It represents redemption. It represents giving, offering, and sacrifice. And he expects us to pick that cross up daily. He expects us, as we pick it up, that we are, ourselves are, uh, are given forth an odor, not B.O., but an order, an order, an odor of that sweet smell in aroma. Not Mitchum. But a sweet, I don't know what you ladies use, but I don't want to know. But that sweet smelling aroma that when you, you are the difference in a crowd, a difference in a situation, you, you bring the difference to the equation. And this is the way the Father would have us to walk daily. And his love, and guess what? It honors Jesus. It honors the Lord. But Paul now goes on to tell us what love is not. He says, but fornication. You know what that word is in the Greek? Pornia. And pornia refers to a bunch of, well, it means adultery, fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism, bestiality. It's the English word where we get what? Pornography. Boy, isn't that a, a problem. Isn't that a problem in our, in our world today? Pornography. Interesting, because what pornography does, if it's not cut off, if it's not stopped, it leads to adultery and fornication and other, other sins that you find yourself in. How did I get here? How did I get here? It's because you didn't listen nor were you convicted by the Holy Spirit. You see, somebody, I can't remember if it's Spurgeon or somebody like that, says God will whisper, son, that's not good. Son, that's not good. Son! And he shouts. And it's usually the shout when they're coming to arrest you because you got so into some dark of this kind of sin that they're coming to get you. You're now allowing the world to deal with you because you wouldn't confess it, cut it off, and run from it. So that is not love that we talk about. That takes. It never gives. It never pleases. You'll never be able to be pleased by this. It's constantly calling you in. It calls you in and deep and deep and deep. And all clean, uncleanness or covetousness, again, these are just bait that bites if it's not dealt with. Because of that, Paul goes on to say, look at, he says, let it not even be named among you. Christian, as it is fitting for saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking. In the Greek, that's moral logia. And it means talking like a moron. Oh, forgive me. Why do we think that's funny? But we do, huh? Forgive us, God. It's talking like a moron. 
um, buffoonery. I like that new word I learned. Um, he says, nor coarse jesting. You know, that's obscene or suggestive joking. Um, he says, that's, these are, which are not fitting. It's unbecoming of a Christian, Paul says. You've heard this illustration. If you were arrested or I were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict me, to convict you? Did they make the right arrest? You're under arrest for being a Christian. And there's plenty of, uh, praise God, that arrest me. Remember, as Paul is writing this, let's get back to understanding who Paul is writing to. Not only is writing to Ephesus, to the church in Ephesians, to the Ephesians, but to all those seven churches of Revelation. It was a circuit of churches. He's writing to all those churches, to Ephesus, right? Laodicea. He's writing to, uh, you know, all these churches that are there, Smyrna, and all those that are, are laid out for us in the seven churches, Sardis. He's writing to all these. If you look at the map, you'll see a circle Uh, in a sense, of churches where this letter was going to be passed around and read to them. And I tell you that because all these things was was an accepted accepted, um, um, lifestyle of the Ephesians and of those churches. This is the way they lived. I talked about that a few Sundays ago. But Paul is telling us these are the antithesis, the opposite of what a Christian is. It shouldn't, he says, it's not fitting. He says we shouldn't involve ourselves with these, but rather giving thanks. Be thankful. Be praising God. Be thank, thank him. As we get our mind on Christ and start to thank him and to praise him, these other things will not, won't be so uh, appealing to us. And he says, then, then it, when we get to the light portion, he says, then we will expose them for what they really are and know that they're not healthy. They're not good for us. He says, give thanks to God. Let's give thanks to God that, and as you'll say, that we were once involved in these things. We looked forward to involve in ourselves in these kinds of things. But now, but now we are to give thanks, to let our tongue and our time and our life praise the Lord with thankful hearts, for it was he who took us from the guttermost to the what? To the uppermost. He says in verse 5, for this you know, and if you didn't know, you know now. That no fornicator, unclean person, that is one who is not cleansed uh, in a moral sense. Because there are people who say, well, I, 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 I'm not a fornicator. I'm not an adulterer. I have no problem with porn. I have no problem. I, I don't drink, smoke, or, or go out with girls that do, or whatever, however that is. But the Bible says to the moralist, and that's who we're speaking of here. that there's still the, the stain of original sin upon you, that there is no one good, what? Not no one. There is no one good, not no one. So if you sit here today and you're saying, well, man, I, I have no problem with that, and, you know, I, 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 hey, but have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Don't be fooled. He says, these will not inherit These will not have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. He went on to say also, the covetous man who is an idolater, and that's really where it starts, right? This is the core or the root of every sin, worship of self. Go back and look over this list and the list that he left off for us in chapter 4, and you'll find that it's all about self, self self-gratification. All I want for myself, it's all about me. And that hence goes back to being a covetous person, an idolater. Let me tell you, there is no one good, no, not one. 
And most of us knew that. Most of us, uh, when the scriptures came, when the gospel was brought to us, we realized, like Peter, God, go away from me. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a clean man. But it was the love of Christ that led us to repentance. His kindness led us to repentance and receiving Jesus as our Savior. There's an old saying that makes sense to me. And it really sobered me. When someone said, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. What's that? Well, born once, and we all are born once. We're here today. We're breathing. If you're only born once, you're going to die twice. That is the second death in the lake of fire, better known as hell at the end of Revelation. But if you're born twice, you'll die once. Born twice, yeah. That is to be, as Jesus said, as he said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Being born again simply means receiving Jesus as your Savior. Becoming that new man, that new woman. Burying the old man. Staying away from that grave where you bury him. <laughs> and now being born again. Being alive, truly. If you're, you're born twice, you'll die once. You'll, you'll give up the breath here. But to be absent from this body as a Christian is to be what? Present with the Lord. That's where you want to be. That's the category that you want to be in. Let no one deceive you, he says, because there are those who will deceive you. And there are those who will bring empty words, devoid of truth, religious talk, lacking the gospel. Oh, it's religious, but it lacks the gospel. Their talk is filled with heresy. They contradict the Bible. They endorse sin. And there's no impact on a person's soul. You're still left empty. Colossians 2.8 says this, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of man, according to the basic principles of this world, giving you a worldview, and not according to Christ, not according to the gospel, not according to God's word. Let no one deceive you with empty words. I remember... Uh, right before I got, it's so interesting, right before I got saved, um, this guy started giving me his philosophy. And I was buying into it. He was saying, yeah, you know, this is what I believe. And he, he was talking about the world and, and, and look at all that's going on. And I started, I started like buying into it. Yeah, 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 man, yeah. That makes sense. I came back the next day, interesting, somebody put a Billy Graham book on my desk I still, to this day, I don't know who it was. How to be born again. I hated that word, born again. Because I didn't like born again Christians. They freaked me out. But I took the book. I never read it. But I did pick this up. Matthew 121. That's as far as I could get. And I accepted Christ as my say. Someone was praying for me. I don't know who. But someone at, was praying for me. They gave me that. Then I read the book afterwards. Don't fall to empty words. And there are a lot out there, friends. They're on TV. They're on the radio, podcast. Don't fall to them. It's empty. It's according to man. And it's the basic principles of this world. And because of these things, Paul says, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. And he's speaking of judgment here. Therefore, he says in verse 7, do not be partakers sharing in with them. Not even occasionally. We are to be the salt and the light. As I said before, we are to be a a witness, uh, but we are not to partake with them. We are not to engage in their sin but be imitators of God as dear children and know who we emulate and know who we follow. And then he says, the second thing is to walk in the light, verses 8 through 14. And here he, he kind of makes more sense. Look at verse 8. He says, for you were what? Once darkness. And everybody said, okay, only you guys are saved and, des- and 
I see Doug back. Doug saved. Amen. Unless you're still dabbling in darkness, unless you're still going on those sites, unless maybe you got a girlfriend on the side or a boyfriend and you're married, you can repent today. Stop that now. Listen to God's whisper. He's calling for you to repent and to cut it off, to cut it out. He says, for you were once darkness, but now you are, you are light in the Lord, man. Walk as children of the light. First John says, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we what? We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Well, that's that's, those good words. He speaks of the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the Spirit also will mark us. He'll mark our life. It makes us different. It's in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Not in fornication. Not in covetousness. Not in filthy communication. Not in deceitful things, but truth. Righteousness and goodness. That is the fruit that is produced out of our hearts. And it reveals the light source which is of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 4 says, for it, is the, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The distinction Paul making, is making here is that we who are saved were once in that dark place. Can I say we were Mushrooms. But now we are in the light. We are oranges. I just had a glimpse of Southern California. 75 degrees yesterday. I'm an orange. As he is the light, we are children of the light. Children of the light. You know, as the moon reflects the sun, we all know that. Let us reflect the son of God's light. Guys, let us be like those old glow... How many remember the glow worms back in the day? Let us be like the glow worm. And I know some of you had the glow worms when you're adults now. And if you kept them, it'd be worth a lot of money. But anyway, you know, and you squeeze them and it glow. It tells you what's inside. It, it tells you, you know... And I don't know if that makes sense, but anyway, hey, what's up? Because, it, and then he says, find out what is acceptable to the Lord. And that's, that's the walk, right? As we walk in the light, more and more, well, light exposes, doesn't it? Light exposes darkness, you know? And, and, and we could be uh, one who want to help one another, and we can encourage one another, but sometimes we want to play the Holy Spirit. And we make lousy Holy Spirits. So be encouraging. So you see someone going down a dark path, you know, let them know, you know, hey, that's not really a good place. Hopefully they'll heed your word. And if not, then, then, then if they're walking in the light, it, it will be exposed as darkness. Then they will have no excuse for not knowing what is or is not acceptable because the Holy Spirit will, the Holy Spirit will prick their heart. The Holy Spirit will be the one who convicts And it's that same light that drives out darkness in our life. For light and darkness cannot coexist. You know where I'm coming from when I say that? I'm sorry. There can be no coexisting. Not with dark and light. So Paul says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Joe Foe said this, there are zero shades of gray. So why are we always trying to find the gray areas? 
You know, why are we always trying to find the loophole? Yeah, but, and you want to argue it, and you want to you want to have a debate about it. When friends, there are no gray, there are no loopholes. You won't find them here. It's truth. Paul is just simply putting it out there. He says, "Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Correct or confront." Take a stand against them, as many did on, on this Friday. We had a whole group going down to D.C. and, and marched there for, on this issue of abortion. Pro-life, man. And, and that's something to confront, and that's something to take a stance against. And yes, that sin can be forgiven, by the way. Even that sin can be forgiven if it's brought to the light. For it is shameful, he says, notice this, look, check this out, verse 12. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. I mean, Paul has already revealed some of those things that are performed in the public at the temple, the lifestyle that these Ephesians lived. But he says there's even other things that I'm not even going to write or talk about. It's too shameful But none of man's secret sins are secret before God. None of them are. Numbers 32, 23 says, be sure your sin will find you out. Man, I want to be found out right now, God. God, show me, Father. Forgive me, God. Put away the things, Lord, of, that is not pleasing you. Put them away, God. Take them away from me. I don't want to be that one who thinks it's a secret, has an extra iPhone or maybe an extra iPad that the spouse doesn't know about. That's it. Come knocking on your door. This is the police. I don't want you to be do that, and I don't want to be involved with that. So I pray for you. You pray for me. Amen. We pray for each other. Be sure your sin will find you out. That is for somebody here today. I don't know who it is. The Lord is just speaking to me right now. Cut it off. Cut it off. Verse 13. But all things that are exposed are made manifest. That means to be made known by light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, awake. Paul's given an altar call here. Awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Paul here has given an altar call to those who are snoring through life and snoring through the sermon and snoring <laughs> through the Bible study. You're coming in, you're punching in the clock, and you're leaving, and nothing's penetrating. I remember going to confession. And it was good. Let's be honest. Those of us who were raised in that historical denomination. And there I was in this room, eight, nine years old, making my first communion and going to have to talk to a man. It's very scary, right? Those of you who know it. And then that door opens. Shh. You know, I, I, I. and then as I got older, shh. And I'm thinking, that guy's worse than me. <laughs> or he's no better than me. What am I? And then you lie. Then you go in there and you lie. You don't say really everything. Oh, that day when I accepted Christ, confession was a beautiful, a beautiful thing. The vomiting of the soul. Embarrassing. No one else heard, though. Embarrassing just to speak forth. But man, was it a... It was like when you walked out of there, even though you lied, you kind of felt a little better, right? Then you went back and did the same thing. But anyway, but this time it was freeing. Again, I, I, and then I start reading the word. Oh, I, I got to stop doing that. Oh, that's not good. And hearing the sermon and, and let, allowing the word of God to penetrate me, to penetrate my heart and my soul. That's what I pray for you guys. Paul's telling us to awake. He's telling the church to awake. You're sleeping 
He says, arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. He's, re- he's speaking to believers here. Let not the church be asleep. Let the people awake. Let's get out of our dead state. Let's get into the light, into who we are in Christ. And let us be the difference everywhere we go. Amen? Let's pray. So, Father, we love you and praise you, God. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for allowing us to expound upon it today. I pray, God, that it falls on ears the Holy Spirit has given to hear. And Lord, if there's anybody here who has yet to give their life to you, I pray today. Today will be the different day. Today will be the day when they just repent. Today will be the day where they're just broken before you, God. And if that's you today, I don't know who it is, but that's you today, then right in your chair, right in your chair, you can just just repent, cry out to the Lord. To Lord God, I'm a sinner. God, I'm open before you. You know my life, but you still want me. You still love me. And I accept you as my Savior and Lord God, believing that on the cross you died for my sins. God, if that wasn't enough, when they buried you, the third day you overcame the grave. Father, save me. Fill me. Seal me with the Holy Spirit, God. I accept you as Savior and Lord. You just pray. Pray something like that. Pray from the heart. If you mean it, God says, I will save you. I will give you the Holy Spirit. I will write your names in the scroll. And for those who there's their names are on that scroll, yet you find yourself drifting far away for whatever it is. And guys, we get there. We we're enticed, we're fooled sometimes because we're we're not in the word, we're not walking right, and we find it ourselves in a pool, a cesspool up to our neck. But you don't have to stay there. Today you come back. Prodigal, come home. Your father loves you and he's waiting for you. He wants to use you as he used you before. He wants to use you. You come home. You just pray out, God, God, forgive me. Cleanse me and wash me and empower me, God. Because he misses the conversations that you once had with him. Get back into his word. Get back into prayer. Get back to the spirit leading you. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, you pray that prayer.